Hello, and welcome to Anatomy of a Convenience Marketer Ransomware Attack. I'm your host today, Emily Ford. I'm a Standards Coordinator at Connexus. And I also coordinate these weekly events. I have just a few pieces of housekeeping for today before we get into everything. First of all, the webinar is being recorded and will be made available on connexus365.org next week. Also, please get your questions entered directly in the GoToWebinar interface early. We're going to have plenty of time at the end for Q&A and we wanna hear from you. Uh, next slide, please. This is the slide that our lawyers make us put in. Uh, just to note it, Connexus does not endorse any products or services described or mentioned in this presentation. Moving on, I'd like to give a big thank you to our 2021 Diamond sponsors. We really appreciate the extra support this year that allows us to continue to do our work on behalf of the industry. And uh, speaking of that work, Connexus is a nonprofit technology organization, and here our members really do the heavy lifting. We provide a neutral forum where retailers and vendors can network and come together to create standards and solutions that are beneficial to our industry. We also educate through white papers and events like this one, and we advocate on a technical level at other organizations to help steer the conversation around standards and policies so that changes don't negatively affect your business. Just wanna take a moment here to point out some of the most recent events at Connexus 365, especially that VIP keynote with Ed Colopy. If you didn't get the chance, please go back and check some of those out. The replays are all available. Uh, and please reach out to us through any of these channels, especially LinkedIn. Like I said before, we really do want to hear from you. And I'd like to take a moment to thank our sponsor for this session, PDI, We're excited you're here. And Chuck Young is going to be our moderator today. He's the Chief Technology Officer for Impact 21 with good reason. He has over 40 years of experience in the retail industry, most of those in petroleum and convenience. And without any further ado, I'd like to hand things off to Chuck to introduce our speaker for today. Thank you, Emily. I appreciate it very much. Uh, as she said, I'm an old guy, uh, 40 years of experience. Robert Chapman, um, is going to talk to us today about something that if, if you haven't been hearing about or or, or see, reading about in any of the news, you're you're uh, somewhere back away from any news structure at all. Uh, ransomware is in the forefront of global politics, national news, commerce, uh, industry, security, and everything. And, and Rob is that IT general with a passion for all things security. He and his family live in Nashville, Tennessee. And for the last several years, he has led security programs for major uh, retail petroleum service providers and also has been the security and engineering lead for a large unbranded retail chain. When he's not goofing off with security projects, he's usually enjoying camping in the great outdoors. Although uh, I'm sure you got a lot to do a lot of that with the pandemic, Rob, but now with all this ransomware stuff, I'm sure you're quite busy. So without further ado, Rob, talk to us about... Uh, ransomware attack. Thank you so much. I appreciate that introduction. Uh, today we're going to be talking about, as he mentioned, and as Emily introduced, anatomy of a convenience marketer ransomware attack. Uh, that is a mouthful, and I don't pretend otherwise. And I think the, the real takeaway from this is we, as a service provider that is oftentimes working with customers who have been hit by ransomware, to do remediation, to help them recover, we kind of wanted to pull the curtains back a little bit. What, what happens? What does it look like on our side of things to respond to this? And what are some of the learnings that we have from this? And, and we had a gracious partner, customer who went through an unfortunate attack who said, you know, please use what you learned from us to tell the story because we think other people need to know how to defend themselves. And that's what we want to talk about today. Um, as Chuck was mentioning there, ransomware, if you're not familiar with it, just to kind of unpack it a little bit, it's, it's something that's been around for several years now. Um, it's not necessarily new, but in some ways it's kind of reaching um, kind of a, a, a zenith. It's, it, it's, it's, it's everywhere. And, and, and it's helpful to kind of understand what it is. And effectively, it's a piece of malware that takes... Um, all of the really great encryption technology that we use every day to secure our information 
and to protect our communications, and it uses it maliciously. And really kind of three things have come together to make ransomware particularly insidious. The first one is a proliferation in the public space of state, nation state built malware. Um, we, we saw this with the leaks from Snowden and others that, you know, nation states all over the world were using cyber warfare to attack one another. And unfortunately, many of those tools got free. As the tools were discovered, reverse engineered, the same holes that they were leveraging can now be repackaged and used by everyday criminals. The second thing is the rise of cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, where sending uh, valuable remissions, you know, what, what you would used to think of something like Western Union or cash is now done digitally. And so you can remit payment easily, quickly over the internet, um, in some cases anonymously, in some cases not so much, but it's easily laundered. And then the third thing is using that encryption to take what's right in front of you and to make it inaccessible. And these three things come together to make something that's really quite terrible as a weapon. One of the challenges I think that we have with ransomware is that when you look at the news, you look at recent attacks, whether it be on something like the Colonial Pipeline, whether it be on a recent hospital, a government agency, or any of these other types of groups out there, when, when you read them, they seem academic. They, they, they seem distant. And one of the biggest challenges that we have as security professionals is helping people to feel security. If, if, if you treat security purely as academic or as purely technical, I think you're going to walk away from this with the same challenges everyone else has with it, which is a terrible understanding of risk when it comes to ransomware. And, and fundamentally, we're talking about risk management when we're talking about security. And one of the biggest challenges is that we as human beings are terrible at estimating risk. And there's really, I think, two reasons that contribute to that. The first one is a temporal one. It's a time-based one. If, if there's something that we know is good or bad for us, but it's distant in its effect, we, we have a hard time doing the right things around it. But if it's close to us in time, we do much better. For example, if I'm driving a car and I'm in traffic and I see someone ahead of me in a situation where they're behaving recklessly or their car is doing something unintended, they're swerving, they've lost control, I have an immediate visceral reaction to that. I know I need to maneuver out of the way or else I may be hit. I may be involved in an accident. I could die. And that near-term experience is what allows me to make really good risk decisions. The second issue is that we have a hard time managing risk if it's not something that we personally experience. If someone else talks about it, if it's happening someone far away, if I'm only hearing about it third or fourth or fifth hand, if it's only in the news, then we have a hard time managing risk. It's too far away from us. Again, if I'm in that car scenario, if I'm driving and if I get in the car and I drive to work and nothing ever happens to me, then I generally have a pretty poor experience of managing risk, no matter what's going on around me. If I'm driving recklessly myself, I'm speeding, I'm paying attention to my cell phone or anything else. But if I'm in an accident, if I go through an intersection and someone blows through a red light or a stop sign and they hit me, or if I'm turning left against traffic and someone's not paying attention and I get T-boned in some way, I immediately have a new profound experience of that risk. If I survive and I go back out on the road again and I drive, if I come to that same interaction, intersection and I, and, and I make that same type of turn or whatever it is that led to that accident, you better believe that I'm going to have a visceral anxiety response to that. And so it's those two elements that I think 
are, are missing in these conversations. I want you to walk away from this presentation today with a whole lot of good information that we will share at the end. But I will feel successful if you walk away terrified, not paralyzed with fear, but terrified that you want to act. I want to activate that instinctive lizard brain part of you that says, we have to do something. Because the biggest challenge isn't that we don't know what to do to defend against ransomware attacks. The challenge is motivating people to do the right thing when they know to do it instead of waiting until it's too late. This is not a problem with technology. It is fundamentally a problem with leadership. And so for those of you that are listening today who are in roles of leadership, this, this message is specifically for you. To, to hear the plea and the, and the cry that there are potentially major holes where we have traded convenience and security in a way that we probably should reconsider. So that's the scenario that I want to kind of frame this conversation in. Those are the parameters that I want us to talk about. But before we begin to tell what happened, let me kind of set the stage in terms of time. It's February 2020, a little over a year ago. And we have at this time seen ransomware explode on the stage. 41% year over year growth in terms of people that are self reporting, which means it's probably much larger than that by now. The average ransomware payment, that's not to say what's demanded, but what actually people end up paying is nearly $85,000. There's been a huge shift from attacking individuals to attacking companies. And at this time, because cryptocurrencies are the primary way that people are sending these payments, the average Bitcoin price is around $9,000. It's floating at this time. It's, it's currently 2021. We're kind of in the middle of the year and Bitcoin is now nearly $40,000 per Bitcoin. So imagine again, it's February. You're the leader of an IT organization. You get up one Wednesday, you check your phone, and it's a kind of a normal day. Normal amount of tickets are starting to come in. You get in your car, you start heading to work, and all of a sudden you start to hear the phone pick up. Ding, ding, ding. The, the email app is starting to come in. It's hot and heavy. Something's going on. You get to the office, much like our customer did, and people are starting to tell them, hey, boss, I think we have an issue with some of the IT systems at our stores. Uh, can you hop on and take a look? It's a small IT shop. Unfortunately, as we all too well know, many IT retail, especially organizations, don't have huge IT budgets and IT staff. And so oftentimes, you know, people at the strategic are also the tactical. So he gets on his computer. He logs into the software that lets him connect to the back office computer of one of the retail sites. He brings up the application and sure enough, it fails. It's not working. And so he begins to kind of look at the configuration to go to see, okay, did something change? Did somebody make a setting? What's happening? And immediately he sees something that disturbs him. Files that are supposed to be there are still there, but they've changed in a way that is unfamiliar and unsettling. The extensions on the end no longer say exe or txt or config or dll or the things that you're used to seeing on Windows systems. They now have strange configurations of letters and numbers. It's the telltale sign of ransomware. And on the desktop of the computer is a web page that's been bookmarked that opens up. And it simply tells you, you've been hit with ransomware. You can't decrypt it. There's not enough energy in the known universe to break this encryption. The only way you're going to get your data back is to send us this unreasonable amount of Bitcoin that represents tens of thousands of dollars to this address. And by the way, there's a clock ticking. If you don't do it in this many hours, we're not going to help you. We're not going to contact you. We're not going to do anything. We're simply going to move on. You're going to lose everything. 
So the sites start pouring in. They have a network that's unfortunately really flat. And so the malware is able to jump from one computer to the other one as it traverses the network. Very quickly, they decide to call us. We gather the war room. We have a series of tools that we give them to deploy to get some ground truth. And soon we discover what we believe is something really terrible. This is a very active and dangerous version of ransomware. It's still active. It's not done. It's moving. We see it activating. They immediately decide they need support. So we put our best engineer named Tom on the next plane. He's there within a couple of hours. He gets on the ground. He meets with the team. And the worst fears are realized. It's now moved from the retail locations to the corporate office because, again, the network's very flat. There's not a lot of network segmentation and firewall controls. And now there's reports of chaos at the corporate headquarters. File servers are starting to go offline. Application servers are failing. Databases are unavailable. Workstations are starting to lock up. Workstations that haven't can't authenticate because Active Directory, the authentication system is now gone. And the last remaining bastion of good data, and there's much to be said about whether or not this is a good practice, but a copy of a lot of financial data is found on the CFO's laptop. Of course, it's unencrypted from them. They disconnect it, they turn it off, they put it in the drawer under lock and key, and they quickly start trying to turn off and salvage what they can. Remediation efforts go on through the night. Command and control continues to be something they fight to try and prevent a foothold from the attacker from being able to get back in. And by Thursday, we start to get some of the initial defenses in place. We start to try and understand what are the demands? What's the effort to comply? What's this really gonna cost us? Are there any back doors, you know, unfortunately, uh, while ransomware has proliferated, in some cases, fortunately, we've also found some ways to recover without paying the ransom. This is not, unfortunately, one of those. We've logged down the network to prevent further communication to the outside. We've done the best we can. And by this point on Thursday, we're starting to exhaust our options. On Friday, we go to the backup systems to try and find anything that we possibly can to recover and we find the backup systems have also been compromised. There's nothing left. So we gather the executives and the leaders of the team for that company into a room. We present the findings and we say, this is unfortunately the worst case. You've lost everything. You have no backups except for what's on the CFO's laptop, which we can't turn on at this time. You have no retail operations. You've lost all of your applications. You have no authentication system. You're dead in the water. Your only chance at this point is really one of two options. You try and rebuild. You start over. You try and put together a plan to get back to continuity as fast as you can. And you see, you know, kind of how the chips fall. Your other option is you pay. And this is where the intersection, if you're not familiar with this world, begins to deviate from what people will tell you is best practice. If you talk to the Secret Service, if you talk to the FBI, if you listen to the CISA, all of these various groups and, and government and agencies that are trying to look out for the public interest on these types of attacks will tell you, do not pay the ransom. It perpetuates the criminal activity. But if there's one thing you see over and over and over again in these activities is that whenever you read in a report or you see in a news broadcast that someone has paid a ransom, what you should listen to and hear is a story of a company that's on the brink. They are doing that because they've lost all other options. The only other option is that the company goes away or is severely reduced. And that's the decision the leadership is left with. Do we try and pay or do we start the layoffs? Do we dissolve or do we live and fight another day? And so the decision is made, let's see if we can pay the ransom. 
Their email system is hosed. So we set up a Proton email account so that we can do some encrypted email communications. And we begin preparing a Bitcoin wallet for remitting payment. Now, the challenge here is that they don't have enough money to pay the demand, at least not easily, not immediately. You know, companies are, you know, not always in a place to have just tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars in cash laying around. And so we go and we talk to the finance people and we say, what's the most that you can scrap together? They give us a number. It's not enough. So we know that we've got to negotiate. So we go, we make our effort. We explain the case. These are criminals, but at the same time, they're kind of like business people. They have two things that they care about. They want to get paid and they want to get paid quickly. So we explain the situation. We can't pay the full amount. We just don't have it. But here's what we can pay. And here's how quickly we can get it to you if everything works out right. We offer them $40,000. They accept. And then we begin to rush to try and get it together. $40,000 $40,000 is great, by the way. I know it seems terrible on the surface, but it was far less than what they were asking for. So the challenge that we have is that it's the weekend. Banks are closed. I don't know if you know this, but you know most businesses don't have Bitcoin accounts laying around with wallets full of Bitcoin ready to go. So now we're scrambling. And the clock is still ticking. And, and you run that risk of, You know, they're willing to wait if you're making a good faith effort in so much as you can do that with criminals, but eventually they'll walk. And if they walk, you'd have nothing. And so we reach out to a company that specializes in this called Coveware to see if we can speed up the process. And they do a great job in this space. If you ever need help with any of these kinds of things, they're they're an excellent resource. There's other groups that are out there like that. I certainly encourage you to investigate them. Coveware agrees, they're immediately able to take payment and send payment on our behalf. We negotiate with the criminals to work with them and they agree, they send the payment and they accept it. Once it's validated on the blockchain, they send us our decryption tool on Monday and we begin the analysis of the tool. You see the challenge with many of these tools, number one, they may not work, Number two, they could have their own malware baked in. Uh, and, and so we have to spend time actually looking at it. So we do that to the best of our abilities to determine is this safe or not. It appears to be safe. And so we begin the decryption process. We focus on the most critical systems, hoping to salvage what we can as quickly as we can because we're trying to get up and running. Because here's the challenge. Our operations at the radio hotel locations are down. You know, you can't, do all of the things that you normally are doing, which means you can't close business. You can't run reports. You can't do all the things that you need to operate. So we have no cash coming in because we can't run. By Tuesday, decryption processes have run overnight. We're making a lot of headway. We've rebuilt authentication systems. Active Directory is back up and running, and we're really starting to make some good headway. Our team is able to wrap up, and they're able to come back and finish the job remotely. And by Friday, we're more or less back to where we were. That's the story. In some ways, it's a happy story. At the end of the day, we got it all back. But I want you to know that when Tom and the team were there in that room making that fateful decision on whether or not they were going to pay, there were tears. These are people that are dealing with stresses unlike anything they've ever experienced in their workspace. Eventually, we will discover that what happened and what led to the account that, the, the, that led to the takeover and the ransomware being successful in getting in was a server that was exposed on the internet with remote directory uh, protocol, the RDP remote session for Windows um, and enabled the remote desktop, sorry, not remote directory, remote desktop. Um, capabilities turned on, no MFA, uh, some shared credentials, um, and no segmentation and network to try and lock it down to specific sources. And when you read the, the, the kind of analysis of many ransomware uh, events, over and over again, you see the same things. Uh, accounts that weren't turned off, 
uh, RDP sessions on the edge, no MFA, uh, all the things that we generally do because we're trading convenience for security. And so I want to try and take a little bit of time with the rest of the time that we have to explain what are the things that could have gone differently that you could have done to have avoided this type of experience entirely. So what is it that you can do to make life harder for those criminals? You know, one of the things that's a challenge for us security folks is we hate to think in terms of absolutes. I, I would never want to sit here and tell you I can 100% prevent malware and ransomware or anything else from ever happening to you. I, I can't do that in good faith. But what I can tell you is we can make it really hard so that it's very unlikely. And here's the steps that I would start with. At the very beginning, as I mentioned earlier, you've got to get leadership buy-in that security is more than just a cost center. It's risk mitigation. And if you can do that, that's not to say that they get unlimited budgets and can do whatever they want, but they understand there's an important trade-off. And so that as we're discussing whether or not we're going to do something, we're making those, those decisions with those trade-offs in mind. As far as what to buy and what to do, the first thing you can do is deploy a great EDR solution. There's many in this space. I can't necessarily recommend any particular one. I've personally worked with CrowdStrike, Sentinel One, Carbon Black. Uh, there's others like Cyber Reason. Microsoft has one at the E5 license. But all of these are designed as next generation AV type systems that specifically do a really good job against most ransomware. Um, we tested the ransomware that this particular customer in the story was hit with against our EDR solution that we sell as a managed service. And we found that it prevented it right at the beginning. And so if anything, you start there. The second thing is you, you try and remove all of the easy access from the edge. Uh, again, if you have those remote desktop sessions on the edge and they're not protected, um, that's the single easiest thing you can do. Uh, put, enforce that you have to have a VPN, enforce that it has to have MFA. Um, and MFA is that multi-factor authentication. Some people will refer to it as second factor or two-factor authentication, but it's that ability to not only require a username and password, but oftentimes a token or a push notification or some other method of validating that you are who you say you are and you're the right person to do that. Besides a VPN and a good MFA solution, patching your systems. Um, and then the last thing is having really good tested backups in place. You know, the challenge with a good backup solution, in this case, with the customer, what had happened is sins of the past had come back to haunt them. They had used the same set of credentials that had been compromised as a part of this attack everywhere within the environment to set up service accounts. And not only that, but their backup system was on the same set of networks as their production system so that they could easily jump between them. And so those are some of the things that lead to the easy compromise of backup systems and making really good backups that are separate from production, um, that are thoughtfully created and you know, disconnected um, are, are really some of the best ways you can use to prevent those kinds of outcomes. Once you get by the essentials, what are some of the other things you can do? Well, at a high level, it starts with being thoughtful about how you manage users. Sometimes we refer to this as least privilege, but there's some other details here. Um, I'm specifically talking about a Windows environment here. I know there's other environments, Mac and Linux. I, I personally work in a almost 100% Linux environment, but the vast majority of people are using Windows in retail locations and on the edge. So that's what we focus on here. Um, but if you have a domain admin account, one of the, the, the hazards I've seen in a lot of IT organizations is people treat domain admin accounts, which are really kind of these, you know, super accounts that can do anything in the environment. They, they, they treat them as daily drivers, and you really shouldn't be doing that. Um, you should only be using domain admin accounts for domain admin tasks, and you should only have a very few number of people set up as domain admins. That really should be only a couple of people. If you've got all of your IT staff using domain admin accounts all the time, something is terribly wrong. Um, even going further than that, you should not have anyone with an admin account on their machine at all as their daily driver. If they need an admin account for certain things, that needs to be a separate account. And that includes your IT staff. Your IT staff should not be running around 
with admin accounts as their daily driver. You need to be turning off built-in admin accounts if at all possible. And where you can't do that, you should be using LAPS. LAPS is a Windows tool for automatically rotating uh, really good passwords on those local admin accounts. One of the challenges that I see in a lot of shops is they have one set of username and password that's sort of a, a god set of credentials to every machine or server in the environment. And that's what LAPS prevents you from doing. Um, you should have unique accounts, long passwords. I'll say a little bit more about that here in a little bit. And then the last thing is when people leave, you should be turning off their accounts. One of the challenges a lot of IT organizations have is that they don't really do a good job of onboarding and offboarding people completely. Um, it's easy to give someone a computer and set up an account. It's hard to always turn them off. And we find over and over again, reports of people, especially in ransomware types of events where stale credentials that were still active, but supposedly not being used, had been found and were used as a part of the compromise. The next thing you could do, and this is an easy one, these things don't cost a lot of money, or if anything, they're free, uh, is to know what you're actually protecting. It's amazing how many IT shops don't know what IT equipment or services or vendors they actually have. And so creating an inventory of all the things that IT is managing is critical. You can't protect what you don't know that you have. And so if you don't have an inventory, start there. Um, if you do have an inventory, is it up to date? Um, this is something that has to be a responsibility of a person. Um, shared responsibilities work very poorly here. It needs to be a named responsibility. Uh, you need to be managing your systems centrally and you need to be doing so with a way that allows you to make on the fly changes to centrally change configuration but enforce consistency. The, the goal here, and I like this, this comes from the DevOps world, is we need to be treating, treating all of our infrastructure, our computers, our servers like cattle and not pets. They shouldn't have names. Um, your infrastructure should be as automated and established in templates and code as possible. Um, that's how you can recover if you have a sudden problem with any of your systems. In terms of some sane defaults, these are some things that I wanted to share, um, especially in a Windows environment. You should turn off SMB v1. This is kind of one of the first big vectors of attack that was discovered as a part of some of the nation state uh, malware that was out there. Uh, disable LLMNR, that's a mouthful, but it's basically a tool that um, is built into Windows environments that allows an attacker to pretend to spoof uh, critical infrastructure. Uh, you should be in charge of your own encryption. You know, the, the easiest way to protect your stuff is to turn on the built-in encryption like BitLocker uh, that is built into Windows. Uh, you should be doing that. When I was telling the story earlier and I mentioned the CFO with all of that important financial data on his laptop, you know, he was yet another story to be told of a gentleman leaving a laptop in a car waiting to get stolen with all of that information on it because it was unencrypted. And I, I've, I've been at companies where that's happened. I, I was at a company one time where an HR person with all of the HR information of every employee, both present and past, was on a computer that was not encrypted. I wasn't in charge of that security, so I can't necessarily take responsibility for it, but it was there um, about the same time I was. Uh, turning on logging and auditing, um, it's sending this to a place, generally what I'm thinking of here is essential SIM. Um, a, a SOC solution. It, this is hard to do for smaller shops, but it's easy to do as a managed service. That's actually the kind of thing we and many other people offer. So I would encourage you to look around for a good uh, SEM SOC solution, and especially a managed one if you can't do that in-house. Uh, get rid of your flat networks. Um, one of the biggest challenges for a lot of organizations is that any computer, any system, any user that's logged into your network in any way can talk to any other system, no matter how far away it is. You know, if I, if I can be at the corporate office as an employee and with no hoops to jump through, talk to a retail location, you've got a bad network. If you can talk to the point of sale or the back office or anything else remotely, you've got a bad network. If you can talk from your computer to another employee's computer, you've got a bad network. 
Um, you should have segmentation, firewall controls, VLANs, all of the things that we regularly use to separate those out. Uh, guest and BYOD, which is very common these days, coming into the office or bringing, those should get internet only. They shouldn't be joining your network and they certainly shouldn't be joining your retail network or your PCI or other audited networks. Um, and it, as already mentioned, workstations shouldn't be talking to one another. So what can you do in addition to some of these things to prevent kind of upfront? Number one, as I mentioned, keep systems up to date. One of the biggest challenges I think a lot of IT shops have and businesses in general is they have one system usually that's kind of that system that everyone wants to die, but they can't kill it off. Either it's critical to some part of the business, um, the vendor who used to make it uh, is no longer around, but we still have to have the software. It can't be updated. It runs on a legacy version of an operating system. You name it. There's lots of excuses, but they're problematic. And, and your goal should be to, to get rid of those as quickly as possible and where you can't to be extra thoughtful about what defense and depth things you can do to wrap around it. Uh, you need to be targeting and training your users. Um, this is something that you can very easily do just by having conversations with them, helping them to see how they could be uh, a potential victim or a path to attack. Uh, you also need to start looking at opportunities to do security and risk assessments. In other words, it's kind of like an inventory, but thinking about it from the perspective of an attacker. Um, who do you think might attack you? How might they attack you? What would the damage be? And this is really that great opportunity to kind of tabletop uh, through various scenarios. If you haven't already, you need to have security professionals on your team and where you can't afford to have a full-time person, you need to be hiring managed services to help you here. Uh, you need to have a plan for response. You need to have a backup plan and you need to be regularly testing it. And by all means, you need to get rid of file servers. File servers are the worst thing in the world because we are, they're dumping grounds for data. They have very poorly managed security in most cases I've ever seen. They're hard to get rid of and kill. Um, you really should be using things like Office 365, Dropbox, you name it. All, you know, Google's got their own thing. Um, they're much better for these types of solutions in modern day sharing of files. Um, but, but those are really some of the big things. Those are kind of the highlights. And there's a lot more that we could go into. Um, we hope that if you have more questions, we could talk about them in the next few moments as we start a Q&A. Um, but if we don't get a chance to talk about it on the QA, you know, feel free to reach out to us or to your managed security services provider, whoever you work with. Um, th th there's so much to do here that I think is very accessible. And I know that, you know, I threw a lot at you. I don't pretend that you can digest or consume it all, all at once. But, you know, I want to say that there's a lot of opportunities here to do a really good job. And I think it starts with, again, having that visceral experience of, I have to do something. It's not someone else's problem. It's my problem. And I'm going to be a part of the solution. I uh, appreciate you listening to me. And I look forward to your questions. And hopefully I can provide some decent answers. Rob, marvelous stuff. Um, just Thank you, sir. Just a, a great summary overview, some good tips. Uh, we'll, we will have uh, questions available, and they are available to be asked in the chat uh, part of the, of the tool to the right for GoToWebinar. There's a question section. Please enter some there. A couple while we're, we're waiting for those to, to fall in, um, because this is recorded and others will listen to it later, uh, we, we won't, probably want to get a little bit de better definition. You use some acronyms in there, EDR. Yeah, so EDR is one of those things that, you know, Gartner likes to make these things up, I feel like, a lot of times. But EDR is Endpoint Detection and Response. Um, you know, everyone wants to have whatever the new cool toy is. So that means they're rebranding their old stuff, packaging it with new things. So there's EDR for Endpoint. There's NDR for network, there's XDR for extended and, you know, MDR for managed. And, and at the end of the day, all of these things basically are taking the same set of tools. Um, they're trying to push, you know, two or three of them together, maybe package them in some, you know, particular way and sell them. But, but at the end of the day, most of them are based on that single 
new kind of next generation endpoint detection and response platform. So when I mentioned, you know, CrowdStrike, Carbon Black, Cyber Reason, Sentinel One, all of those, those are examples of EDR tools. Great. Um, you said get rid of everybody's access on the edge. Uh, and, and I don't know if I really know what you mean when you say on the edge. Yeah, that's a great question. You know, one of the things that we see a lot, um, and it's a huge challenge, especially, you know, where I come from, the managed network, you know, services space, is that, you know, when you have a, a computer network, let's say at the office, um, in a retail location, what's very popular is to say, I want to check in on my store by looking at the cameras on my video surveillance system. And so I need to be able to get to that video surveillance system from anywhere. Now, the ideal way to do something like that, if you feel like you've got to do something, is you would have a VPN and you would log in and have an encrypted connection to your back office there and you could check that video out. Often though, people trade convenience and security. And what they'll do is they'll say, I don't need a VPN, I'll just poke a hole in my firewall and I will just hit that little pinhole on my firewall and get right into it. And a lot of people don't realize everyone could do that, not just you. Um, and, and if you don't have extra, you know, username and passwords and authentication and, you know, like I mentioned, multi-factor authentication around there, then it's wide open. You know, if, if you're interested in seeing just what's out there, there's a great platform called Shodan. Shodan IO, um, it's basically the Google of these types of things. You can go and show me every webcam that's open on the internet. Show me every gas pump that's not, you know, locked down or every, you know, fuel telemetry system or anything like that. And so, you know, it's very dangerous to think I'm just a little person. No one's ever gonna see me. They don't care about my network. Um, one of the things that we regularly see is that we log all activity on the edge of our systems and our customer systems. And you are being scanned and poked at and prodded hundreds, if not thousands of times a day. And that's the thing that I think a lot of people don't realize is that a lot of the early parts of a ransomware or other malware or other type of attack is fully automated. You know, it, it's not criminals, you know, sitting at keyboards. No, they've written programs to do that first set of surveillance. And so, you know, you want to make that kind of stuff as hard as you can, because there's other people who are not as smart as you, and they're going to make that mistake. And unfortunately, you know, for them, them being easier of a target than you is part of the defense that you get to take advantage of. You don't have to be faster than the bear. You all, I don't right. have to be faster than you, right? <laughs> That's exactly right. Okay. Uh, from one of our uh, attendees, do you think the solar winds and a Celion attacks have spread possible ransomware that we have not seen come up active yet? You know, I, I, ransomware in those particular cases, probably not, because those seem to be um, examples of nation state types of activities. And so generally nation states are not primarily interested in uh, targeted criminal activity in the sense of, um, you know, ransomware. Now, the, the nation states are very much involved in uh, corporate espionage on behalf of their local industries. And so, you know, you know, if they can get into Boeing or Lockheed or SpaceX and steal plans for the next rockets, a company that, you know, in another country that's developing rockets is very interested in that or, you know, military aircraft or anything like that. Um, those types of supply chain attacks tend to be examples of large nation state attacks. Now that's not to say they couldn't do that. And what you know, I was alluding to earlier is the challenge that a lot of the nation states have is that once they have weaponized these vulnerabilities that they've discovered and spent billions and you know, untold sums of money packaging cyber weapons around, once somebody else finds that and figures out how to do it, they could do it too. And so while this may not be an example of it, there's nothing that says some you know, criminal organization that spends you know, several million dollars developing their version of the weapons might not sneak back in and do the same thing. And that's what we continue to see. And I think that's the thing that's so sad about a lot of this is that you know, these are the canaries in the coal mine, so to speak, of, hey, 
yeah, nation state did this. Let's all fix it now. Um, we continue to see over and over and over again that many of the types of attacks that lead to ransomware extortion type wear attacks are things that have been fixed and patched for several years now. And so, you know, that's where the excuses really begin to kind of die off from this. But in terms of, you know, answering that direct question, I don't think so. But, you know, that's the thing that we continue to see years and years later after some of these really sophisticated nation state attacks, just how capable they were from the very beginning. If, if you really want a thrilling read, uh, I think Wired is who did it. Um, they wrote the original write-up of the first major nation state cyber weapon, which was Stuxnet. And it is one of the most interesting reads about those types of weapons out there. And, and, and I think it really kind of sets the stage for all of the weapons that have come since then. Okay. Uh, another one from our group here in, in a different sort of uh, arena. How can, an, how can a retailer, a convenience store chain, an operator test their own employees for phishing risks? Ooh, this is a good one. And I've got a, a lot of opinions that, you know, that, that may differ with other security professionals. The one thing that I want to do whenever I'm engaging with individuals is I want them to know that they're part of the solution, not part of the problem. Oh, yeah. And you can run a phishing campaign to try and educate your users that simulated and and make consequences around that in such a way that it actually prevents people from doing the right thing. You actually end up training them to hide and to, you know, not reveal when they've made mistakes and those kinds of things. And um, I, I have a brother who works in an industry that unfortunately is heavily regulated and, and he kind of works in a place where he's talked about that happens a lot. You know, that they, they're it's built more fear than it's actually built conducive security response. So what you really want to do is, is help people to understand, number one, you're part of the solution. You're, you're there to be the first line of defense and you're, you're here to help us. And so the best way you can help us is just tell us if you, if you see something, say something. If you clicked on something and you felt weird, let us know. And, you know, we want to hold people to a high bar, but at the same time, we, we don't want to uh, put them in a position where they start thinking about their own personal best interests instead of the best interests of the entire group. And so there's a trade-off there. Um, I, I think just simply having a conversation about what does good email hygiene look like um, it goes a really long way. You know, I, I used to run an email system for a retail location and I had a mailbox set up where I could kind of look at some of the emails that they weren't supposed to be sending um, hitting me. We had rules that filtered it out. And it was amazing to me how many people used their retail back office systems for printing off, you know, monster truck ticket shows or you know, getting quilting designs or any number of other personal things. And it's just helping people to understand work email, work systems are not personal systems. And you should be communicating with people you know, you should be doing so in a way that has established processes. You know, um, if anyone's ever asking you to buy or manage gift cards or prepaid cards or to quickly move money, you know, those are immediate signs, you know, of, of issues. So, I think it just comes to understanding, you know, what's the role of the individual within that particular retail experience, really including them as an advocate and not as someone that's looking to get punished. Um, and then just having those regular touch points of examples of, hey, here's what, you know, a potentially successful phishing attack looks like. And here's the thing that I think most people don't understand. Most really good phishing attacks are trying to accomplish one thing. And that's credential harvesting. They're trying to steal your username and password. And the way that they do that is they will send you to a website that looks very legitimate. It's asking you for things like logging into email, uh, answering survey questions, you know, about benefits or any other of, you know, completely innocent things. It will prompt you to use your username and password. And we're so programmed to just start pumping those fields with every username and password, you know, that we think we have uh, a really good system will not give you instant malware. It won't in any way tip off what it's doing. It'll just simply forward you on to the real thing afterwards. And so being very aware of, is this something that I should be using with my corporate credentials or do I need to ask someone? Um, and, and unfortunately, you know, with our move to single sign on systems, in some ways I've, I'm, 
somewhat concerned we've made this a little harder for end users to kind of delineate, but um, I, I think there's some meaningful trade-offs there as well. So it's a big topic, but I think at the end of the day, it's about repeated education. And I'll totally agree. You know, is the CTO in my organization, and, and we have roughly about 40 people spread mm -hmm. across the country, we are employing an outside service at a cost. It's not a huge cost, but at a cost to, to monthly fish test everybody, including me, mm -hmm. right? Absolutely. And, and that co goes right back to your original point there about buy-in from the executive level. We're right. budgeting this amount, and it's not you know terribly high, but to have real people help us learn, this mm. is what you should and shouldn't do. Um, you know, the the biggest key out of that for me and my team is you know, we have people who click, and, and we don't want them to click, but we right. don't out them. That's it, the point is not to point fingers and say John, John Doe did this. It's here's something that you shouldn't have done. Let's all learn from that. And, and what that teaches you, too, and it is that those are individuals, especially if you have repeated failures, where it's just these are people that just don't get it for whatever reason. That's where it tells you, hey, I've got to wrap extra security around these people. Right. Um, you know, and, and one of the first things I will tell you is that if you do not have multi-factor authentication turned on for email, you're doing it wrong. Yep. Um, you should absolutely have for all email multi-factor authentication. Um, and uh, that that's the easiest first step you can take uh, to try and prevent that. Sure. And then I, the other thing I'd say is because all of us are sales organizations in one way or another, mm -hmm. those frontline salespeople are the ones you have to train the most. Not everything is a lead. Not everything is a click. That's right. Think before you act, right? Yeah. Hey, uh, we're not gonna we're not gonna run out of time here. But here's an interesting question from from the audience. What's the safest way? to proactively scan threat actor water holes for compromised credentials and data? You know, the, the, the easiest one is the um, have I been uh, owned list or pwned is how it's pronounced. Um, right. Troy Hunt began that project several years ago. He since handed it off. Um, and, and that is the single best resource to use. And a lot of companies, he's offered that now as a service with an API, which is a way for integrating with programs. A lot of applications now are starting to build that in. Um, Microsoft now has the ability with some of their licensing to evaluate, you know, are these credentials already been compromised um, and, and similar types of things. So that's, that's the single best. Um, there's also, if, if you get into the pen testing space, a very popular a set of list of stolen credentials you can check called the Rocky list. Um, it's kind of the most extensive one that's out there. Now it's it's a multi gigabyte text file. I don't encourage just any random person to go look at it because it, you know it's kind of meaningless. But you know for your IT security professionals, it's something they should be familiar with and aware of. And it's a good example of the types of tools that are available to people to do uh, credential spraying attacks where they're trying lots of combinations of usernames and passwords. So you know, I, I don't encourage anyone to go and try and find that stuff themselves. There's a whole group of security professionals that know how to do that effectively. But those are two good resources I'd point to to, you know, find that information. Okay. Uh, how about a little bit of realism in all this? Because as you said, until it really affects me, it doesn't affect me. Should I uh, think about going and establishing a cryptocurrency account with just a little bit of money in there so that I have it to start with, just in case? Um. I don't think that's particularly the answer. Um, I, I, I don't think that um, that's where you want to start, even though that was clearly part of the issue we ran into. I will tell you that companies like Coveware are where you want to develop those relationships and partnerships with, you know, your legal team that you have either in-house or on contract should be able to put you in touch with those types of organizations they are very reasonable in their fees. When when we found out how much they were going to charge to provide that service for us, I, I tell you, that was like the, the breath of fresh air. They're not there to take advantage of the fact that you're getting squeezed already. They're there to do a great service for a very reasonable fee and, and the, trust the professionals. You know, I, I don't think, uh, you know, unless you're just somebody that has a real passion for getting into cryptocurrency, and I don't know many IT people that don't, um, it's not really the space for the average person to be playing in on behalf of their their company. It's just 
it's, there's just still a lot of unknowns and lack of training and awareness that most people don't have access to um, that I think provide the kind of wisdom you need to exercise those things well. Okay. Um, lastly, but not leastly for me, as we, we learned at the beginning, I've been around for a while. Mm. And, and file servers and share files are where it's at, man. Oh, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. They're, they're, they're great. Yeah. So I guess uh, no file servers are even. On, how do I get off of that behavior and into, you know, saving it at SharePoint in the cloud, yeah. Dropbox, those kind of things? Um, I think there's three things that you need to do. The first one is um, you need to have a document retention policy, and that needs to come out of your legal and, you know, compliance groups where, you know, you don't save everything. You know, one of the things that's unfortunate about file servers is that storage is cheap and we're all hoarders. And what you should have is really good automation to the degree that you can implement it that says, you know, these types of files, they exist for this many years and then they go away. These types of files exist for this long a period of time and goes away. Same with your email. Um, if you can have an email retention policy at all, it's one of the best things you could do for yourself for lots of reasons. Um, it's hard to kind of convince people to do it because, again, they use email as sort of their brain of you know, what's happened in history. Um, but that's one thing you can do from a policy perspective. Um, I think the second thing you do is you just start working out of the new tools, you know, as you migrate to Office 365 OneDrive or, you know, Google's version or Dropbox, whoever you use for, you know, document sharing in the cloud, you will naturally start moving your most important working files there. And it gives you a good place to start saying, okay, can we start archiving these other files offline? We don't necessarily remove them, but, you know, we pull them offline. If you find you need something, someone in IT can go grab it, puts it back on. And, and what happens is you, you start sharing with much greater fidelity. Um, and, and again, you have copies that are saved elsewhere. Um, and, and then, you know, the third thing is stop using file servers as um, backends for application development. One of the things that we were guilty of very badly in the 90s and early 2000s, and even to some degree today, in a lot of retail applications, if you're writing your own software, uh, we had a notorious habit as developers of dumping files on a file server. So there's always some share that's some shuffling ground for let's move files from here, we'll pick it up with this script, we'll automate, we'll do this. Those things need to move. You know, there's a whole set of best practices around that that don't include file servers. Um, you know, you should be using APIs, you should be using object storage like, you know, S3 or similar types of things in AWS. Um, those are the places that those types of automations and applications and things should be going to. And so if you can decouple these custom applications from the server, decouple your everyday access in terms of what you're doing from the server and then build good compliance around how long you keep those files, you'll go a really long way into purging them. Marvelous. Well, we're close to the top of the hour. Um, personally, myself, Rob, I want to thank you for this. This has been very educational for me on behalf of, of, of the audience and, and the, the team at Connexus. We want to say a hearty thank you to PDI for sponsoring this and for providing Rob's, Rob's time to do this. As Emily said, this will be available in a week or so in the recorded format. As an attendee, you'll get a notice of that. And uh, please come back and see us again next Thursday for the next webinar. Thank you all very, very much. Thank you so much. Appreciate it.